panel is on energy security in Asia. I think we all know that uh, the energy narrative picture in Asia has changed very dramatically in, in over the last decade, at least in part because of the rapid economic growth. So we have two great, uh, th four great panelists to join us here today and who will give us uh, brief overviews uh, of the situation from their perspective, and then we'll have a discussion involving the audience. So our first speaker is Jonathan Elkind, who is the Ac uh, Acting Assistant Secretary of, of, for International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Energy. Previously, uh, Jonathan w served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy and International Affairs. And earlier, before that, he worked at the Brookings Institution on uh, energy security and foreign policy issues. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Murray. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, at, uh, at CSIS today. I see that one of the, the dilemmas, dilemmas of having a beautiful new building is that uh, the, uh, the world outside, uh, we, you get reminders that the world outside is out there and uh, uh, a, a distraction, it, it certainly is. Um, it is, uh, in, in my view, very fitting that um, we have this discussion about uh, energy security in the Asian frame um, uh, at this time and also in this place uh, because um, between the developments in energy security, the challenges and opportunities that one sees emerging uh, in Asia and those that one sees emerging in the United States over the last several years, uh, one could say that uh, the two are um, the most dynamic pieces of uh, the global energy scene at present. Um, the United States and our companies have worked together with the countries and companies of Asia on energy issues for quite a long time. Uh, nonetheless, I think it is worth taking a step back and looking at kind of the current state of play in terms of context uh, that uh, provides the backdrop to our discussion uh, on this panel. Um, in 1977, um, U.S. crude oil imports amounted to 46 percent of uh, U.S. Uh, consumption. That rose as high as nearly 70 percent uh, a few years ago. Uh, but dramatically then, in the period uh, uh, of the, this uh, new young uh, century, we've seen a, uh, an important change. Uh, in 2013, domestic crude oil production in the United States uh, amounted to uh, nearly 10 million barrels a day, uh, on, uh, and uh, it looks like now, uh, for the foreseeable future, the uh, imports of crude oil into the United States will be on a downward trend, not an upward trend that was true so very recently. Um, in Asia, meanwhile, one sees dramatic growth uh, in crude oil consumption and in other energy consumption. Um, according to ADB, the Asian Development Bank, um, net oil imports in the Asia Pacific region uh, will rise to more than 25 million barrels a day by 2035. And that's pretty close to the uh, current crude oil output of the Middle East. Um, within that, the International Energy Agency foresees that oil dependency in Southeast Asia uh, will be probably on the order of 75 percent by that same uh, time period of 2035. These statistics, I think, um, are useful as framing on the oil side because they speak to the importance of investment and trade across uh, boundaries. And between different regions uh, of the global energy world. Um, one can see similar interesting changes happening in total demand. If you look at some of the data um, uh, historically back to the 1970s, um, in 1977, the United States accounted for 31 percent of global oil consumption. Um, Asia was roughly 17 percent in that same period, and today we find that those uh, orders of magnitude have roughly, have roughly reversed, uh, with the United States consuming around 20 percent of global production, Asia around 33 percent. Um, so I, I won't go more further into uh, this context, but I will just um, underscore that whether one looks at coal uh, with the dramatic rise of uh, coal combustion uh, 
in China, in other uh, Asian uh, countries, whether one looks at uh, oil, whether one looks at natural gas, uh, with increasing uh, global trade of uh, liquefied natural gas, one sees very, uh, very dynamic growth um, all across, uh, across Asia, and that is an important backdrop to our topic today. If I look from the, um, the, the U.S. perspective um, at how we are engaging uh, with our partners in Asia, um, I would call out several different features. Um, one is that uh, the United States is committed to working with our partners, our friends, our allies uh, from around the globe uh, to enhance energy security for all uh, uh, involved. In May of this year, um, the G7 energy ministers met in Rome um, for the purpose of a renewed focus on energy security as an issue that, again, had kind of emer had receded from view for a period of time and then reemerged into our, uh, the, for the forefront of our focus. A second piece of the U.S. Uh, uh, energy policy that I would emphasize at the outset is a focus on accelerating a transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, in June of last year, President Obama rolled out his climate action plan, which calls for important steps that will significantly alter over a long horizon um, the profile of U.S. energy consumption uh, and, uh, and use. Uh, in addition, uh, the President's climate action plan called for steps to make our energy systems and our economy uh, and more broadly uh, significantly more resilient to a changing climate, because this is the reality that we already are experiencing. And third, we are engaging with international partners uh, on this agenda as well. Let me give just a couple of examples uh, before I uh, close. One, in the context of APEC, um, the United States has worked very closely uh, with partners from all around uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Uh, focusing on um, energy development, energy security, and energy sustainability. Um, for example, the w Energy Working Group under APEC um, uh, is pursuing now goals of reducing energy intensity by 45 percent across, uh, all, across all of the economies of, of APEC by 2035, based on 2005 levels doubling the share of renewable energy uh, in, a in the APEC economy's energy mix uh, by 2030, and uh, collaborating on the phase-out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. In the International Energy Agency, which counts as its members, uh, among its members, uh, several um, uh, Asian, uh, important Asian partners, um, the membership of the IEA has been seeking to uh, increase its, uh, our engagement with other non-member uh, countries uh, across, uh, across Asia. One particular example that I would give in this context uh, are the conversations about a new form of a non-member uh, affiliation between IEA and some key partners, including China and India. Uh, this is the idea, still under development, uh, of an association relationship between those non-members and IEA. This is motivated by our general sense, again, that the dynamism in the Asian energy uh, context is one that calls for significantly increased uh, engagements. We are also working bilaterally with important partners all across uh, Asia. I will not, in view of time, go into details here. I will simply highlight um, three, well, let's call it four, in view of Prime Minister Modi's uh, visit this week, four key Asian relationships uh, that matter deeply to the United States in the energy arena. One is with India, where earlier this week there was a series of announcements uh, about new initiatives uh, in the energy and climate space. A second is with China. Um, indeed, uh, when the APEC summit uh, occurs in about six weeks' time, um, it is reasonable to expect that, again, energy will be uh, an important part of that conversation, 
and certainly in the bilateral meeting that President uh, Obama will have with President Xi Jinping, we expect the same. Japan has been for years um, a, a very, very important partner to the United States all across the waterfront in terms of different technology uh, spaces, in terms of policy collaborations, energy efficiency, the gamut uh, from, from one to the other. And last but not least, um, our uh, collaborations with the Republic of Korea um, are, I would say, uh, also an important uh, piece of uh, our bilateral work. So I will stop here um, and uh, hope that I've been able to provide a, at least a, a, a point of departure from the U.S. perspective. The core point that I would emphasize is, that, is the following. Uh, in a time when one sees a great deal of dynamism in the energy context of the United States, um, we nonetheless uh, are focused very, very closely on the fact that um, the dynamism in the Asian energy economies uh, is the other uh, uh, prevailing reality. We applaud this. We want to work closely with Asian partners. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you all may have after the, uh, the, speakers, the other speakers have finished. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Jonathan, for that very helpful uh, overview. Our, our second speaker is Mr. Tanayuki uh, Sumita. Uh, Mr. Sumita is the Director General of Natural Resources and the Fuel Department in the Agency for Natural Resources and Energy in Japan's Ministry of Economy and Trade. Previous to this job, he served uh, with MITI in Brussels, uh, where he worked to improve cooperation between the EU and Japan. And Sumita-san is a graduate of Georgetown University. Please, Sumita-san. Thanks, Mari. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here in front of you to explain the, uh, our view on the energy security issues in Asia. And also, I'm very happy to, to come back here after uh, the 22 years <laughs> uh, after the graduating the Georgetown University Foreign Service. And uh, as you well know that uh, the energy security issue is one of the very uh, important issues in, in energy policy in any country. Uh, the, uh, the main pillars of the energy policy is uh, so we call three E's, energy security, economic growth, and um, environment. Uh, and in the case of Asia, uh, the Asian countries have a very good mixture of the supply, supply, and, demand, uh, supply and consumption. I mean, some of the Asian countries are the supply countries of energy, and some are the very big uh, consumer of energy. But uh, uh, at the same time, we have facing we have faced uh, several challenges, especially recently. The first one is, as uh, uh, Mr. Elkind mentioned, uh, the uh, increase in the oil import in the future. And secondly, we are facing, still, we are already facing that, the very uh, high price of gas, uh, especially LNG. Uh, this means that we have some trouble, some difficulty in utilize, best utilizing the uh, natural gas. And third one is the how we can uh, make those two uh, challenges compatible. Uh, uh, so, uh, the energy, uh, uh, environmental issues, and economic growth, especially in the case of coal, how to utilize the coal. And at, at the current situation, the biggest challenge is how to respond to the uh, energy demand. Uh, from the viewpoint of the primary energy supply, uh, we have a very good mixture of oil, uh, gas, and uh, coal, and so on. But uh, as to the uh, secondary energy, uh, we clearly see that the very um, rapid increase of the demand uh, on electricity. Uh, the, uh, some uh, prediction says that during this coming two decades, uh, the demand of electricity will increase by, um, um, by 100 uh, percent. But at the same time, uh, we need to uh, secure the environment or conserve the environment. Uh, that's why we need to encourage those uh, Asian countries to utilize uh, non, um, uh, non coal uh, or uh, uh, some kind of uh, very less coal options like uh, nuclear or renewable energies. This is the very common idea 
uh, maybe uh, which have uh, which are uh, totally shared with the U.S. government uh, to encourage the uh, local options uh, to uh, Asian countries. But at the same time, if we uh, see the uh, energy security issues or en economic uh, growth, uh, the still uh, in ma for many Asian countries, uh, coal is uh, uh, coal has some advantage in those um, from those point of view. Uh, that's why, the, according to the IEA's prospect, uh, at this moment, the uh, portion of the coal power plants is 70%, uh, 70% of total electricity supply, and it will still uh, more than half in the year 2013. Uh, 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 in other words, the uh, total electricity um, demand uh, on coal power plant will increase by 80% uh, during this coming 20 years. Uh, to reduce the dependence on, dependency on coal is one of the very uh, common interests for US and Japan in Asian countries. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, uh, the initial approach is to encourage them to utilize nuclear, gas, or renewable energy, uh, those kind of uh, low, low carbon options. But at the same time, they have uh, they are facing that uh, some uh, concern on financial or security uh, and so on. Especially in the case of gas, we are facing the very high price of new, uh, high price of natural gas. That's why the gas is not the very uh, good option for uh, East Asian countries. And also, nuclear and renewable ha will cost a lot. Uh, that's why. Um, uh, idealistically speaking, to reduce drastically the dependency on coal is the best option for uh, U.S. and Japan. But uh, maybe more pragma pragma pragmatically, uh, to reduce the CO2 emission from the coal power plant is the, uh, the uh, second best option and the very big challenge for us. And to reduce the CO2 reduction in the, uh, from the coal power plant is uh, the uh, the mainly um, realized by the improvement of e efficiency of ele uh, electricity generation, and uh, in, in in the current uh, situation, the big the uh, most um, advanced technology is the ultra supercritical, uh, which is which has more than 45 percent energy efficiency. And it is uh, almost 20% uh, better uh, than the very traditional coal power plants. It means that we can uh, reduce uh, the CO2 emission by 20%, 20% to uh, by introducing a very high efficient uh, coal power plants. Um, and, but uh, at the same time, uh, the, such kind of high tech, high, high efficient coal power plants cost a lot. In the case of uh, ultra supercritical coal power plants, it takes almost 1.4 billion uh, US dollar uh, to introduce uh, the, uh, the, those kind of uh, USC, ultra supercritical. It is almost 40% uh, more expensive uh, compared with the very conventional subcritical. Such kind of, and also, if we compare the total cost, uh, for example, by 40 years' time, the total cost is almost the same in the case of uh, subcritical and ultra -sub supercritical. That's why th this uh, big initial cost should be uh, financed uh, by some ways. That's why uh, we need to encourage uh, the uh, Asian countries to introduce as high as possible uh, technology uh, concerning uh, concerning coal power plants, <clears throat> and uh, by doing so, uh, we can avoid uh, uh, some uh, introduction or uh, deployment of low uh, efficient uh, coal power plants, which may be supported by undisciplined uh, finance uh, taken by non OECD countries. Uh, if we can uh, very effectively encourage uh, them to introduce the high uh, coal power plants, then the total CO2 uh, emission will be reduced um, by 20% at most. And in, in this situation, uh, the uh, very important function for, the, for Japan is, uh, uh, is following. First of all, we have a very high 
efficient uh, core performance in operation, uh, especially the ultra supercritical, uh, with a very uh, big strength of uh, operational technique and also the maintenance technique, which, uh, which enables uh, to maintain the high, uh, qual uh, high, efficiency, uh, high efficiency rate uh, for a long time. It is a very important point. And also, uh, we are now um, investing a lot to the next generation technology like IGCC or IGSC. In addition to that, uh, we have uh, made a lot of effort uh, in cooperation with the U.S. government or U.S. partners uh, in, the, in the area of uh, carbon capture storage or carbon capture utilization. A bit, uh, to, uh, have, uh, to share these um, recognition is very important, and uh, already in the end of uh, last, uh, in the end of August or in the end of last month, uh, uh, Japan ASEAN meeting, Japan ASEAN ministers meeting, or uh, East Asian Summit uh, uh, Energy Minister meeting, um, issued some joint statement related to uh, the introduction of green coal technology. Uh, so, uh, in sum, uh, we, we see that in the future, uh, in the Asian area, uh, the demand on energy will increase, but uh, we need to uh, have a very strong concern on the uh, environmental issues. That's why we need to have some solution to uh, make both, uh, at both uh, challenges compatible uh, by introducing uh, several measures, including uh, the encouragement of uh, deployment of C carbon coal technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sumita-san. That was uh, very helpful. Uh, our, our third speaker is Dr. Han Puman, who is an energy economist at IRIA. They, they have a, a very uh, long name. It's even longer than CSIS. Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, and it's based in Jakarta. Uh, Dr. Puman, or Dr. Han, rather, um, is, uh, does work here on energy security, energy efficiency, coal technology, power infrastructure connections, uh, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Han is a graduate of the, of, in economic development and policies from Kobe University in Japan. Dr. Han, please. Thank you very much, Maurice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good morning indeed. I'm so delighted to be here having opportunity to speak to you about Asia Boy in terms of energy security. I, I, I would like to start off by uh, saying several challenges so that will come, so give you a clear picture why I derive conclusion in terms of energy security in that way. Perhaps the way Asia thinking uh, and US and North America and Europe perhaps have slightly different perspective. Uh, that's why I want to start off by challenges what we are facing so that the conclusion will be understood by many participants here. Uh, as you see that Asia is growing in terms of economic growth that exciting, that uh, given a, a decade of econ a robot economic growth. But that growth also in encompassed with many challenges, uh, that including the rising of energy demand. Rising of energy demand is not a good news that we have to curb those uh, energy demand by various major measure. And also with the growing population, just ASEAN and East Asia alone uh, have 3.3 billion population. ASEAN has 600 million population. And imagine how many population are denied it in terms of uh, energy access, particularly for electricity. So in terms of uh, energy demand in the region actually by today, by now, until 2035, for ASEAN and East Asia as a whole, that energy demand will grow by double from 400 million ton of oil equivalent up to 8,500 uh, 8, million ton of oil equivalent. And in terms of energy perspective, it, it, it enormous uh, issue that how we secure reliable energy in terms of affordable price to keep up the growth by saying that how many more population we provide access to modern commercial energies. So to, to say that I think uh, this issue we are facing is, one is providing energy access, keep energy securities, and also uh, the issue to keep economic growth. So another point is we are at the crossroad that we also stride the balance of environmental issue. So how actually 
as Asia perspective and position in terms of energy security. I think it depends on how you look at energy security. I'm familiar with several faces here. They are experts on energy securities, and, but depend on how you look at it. And in the energy mix in Asia, particular ASEAN and East Asia, you see that among energy mix, you have fuel, you have uh, coal, you have renewable and others. But coal has played a very significant and important role in striving economic growth in ASEAN and East Asia. To say that U.S. and North America have really enjoying coal in the past six decades to keep U.S. By, by now until you have a cell gas that could push another scenario of uh, issue. But saying ASEAN now, we are not really enjoying the cell gas like the North America has enjoyed because the price are four or five times and we do not have infrastructure and connectivities like in North America in terms of pipeline connectivity. More LNG are met by import and our production actually very low but will be met mostly by 31% of import for LNG. But if you look at in energy mix in terms of coal, Coal have a greater share in energy mix, more than 50%, and continue to be almost 50% in energy mix by 2035. So uh, with energy security perspective, that one need to have a reliable delivery and affordable price. So coal, are, in terms of supply stability for Asian, is very good. So by Indonesia and Australia having very reliable price and supply in the region. So in, in that regard, coal remain a very strategic important for, for, for energy security for ASEAN and East Asia. I think when we are coming to stride the balance between how we are concerning the way the coal has been burning currently, and the practice actually uh, ASEAN and East Asia, but for emerging economy and poor countries, they are burning coal wastely because of the current power plant. Coal power plant have very low efficiency in terms of thermal plant. So, but there, there are a variety of options there, including these uh, clean coal technologies. By introducing clean coal technology, you can burn coal more efficiently and at the same time saving fuel and minimize operation and maintenance costs. But the, the key issue is the upfront cost investment are higher compared to low efficient coal uh, power plant. And currently there's a variety of technology there. Currently that Japan having the high efficiency coal power plant and those China is emerging, but I think there's some struggle in terms of how reliable of those uh, power plant. So in that regard, it's ASEAN actually also express interest in using high efficient coal power plant. But we're not able to afford that because upfront costs. So with that regards, my institute, there, where I come from, we conduct this uh, comparison of the economic return in terms of different type of clean coal technologies. And we found that by using ultra uh, supercritical power plant, it really provide a very a good return in terms of economic and environmental benefit, just within 25 time frame period. And in terms of provide electricity cost and cheaper in terms of leverage cost of electricity. So with that, we really provide strong recommendation to uh, East Asia Energy Meeting that ASEAN should actually afford this kind of uh, high efficient technology coal power plant, uh, which is the, the current technology are mature, are commercialized, but why are they not able to access to those technology because of upfront cost? Uh, with that context, I would say that this deployment of clinical technologies are urgent to support that if the ASEAN cannot afford that, they can afford lower, cheaper technologies that could be locked in so many years before it, uh, it can change any scenario. So there's, there must be international framework in that regard to support ASEAN to afford clean coal technology, but particularly would be a public financing because those upfront costs will be high. Any company, I think it's difficult to, 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 to access loan or whatever created by itself without support, uh, public financial support on clean coal technologies. And 
uh, with that regard, I think it's a very, very crucial role. Suppose that in the absence of the public financing on clean coal technology, imagine that non-OECD member country, particularly emerging Chinese uh, company and other, they are ready to invest in a low, lower, I mean, cost and also less efficient. So more ASEAN likely to afford those from Chinese technology. Why current efficient technology are available and we are not able to afford it. So in that regard, I think I would like to, to stress that any these public financial support will make ASEAN uh, a green growth in that regard. Otherwise, we will, will find a brown uh, economy in the future. So with that, I will stop and then take questions uh, uh, later on. We have interaction. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Dr. Han. Our uh, fourth speaker batting cleanup, to quote uh, Dorothy Dwoskin, is Michael Leifman. He is, uh, uh, directs GE Power and Water's long-term power generation forecasting. Uh, be prior to working for GE, Michael led the modeling efforts at the Department of U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Michael, thank you very much. And I think Michael wants to use the, a PowerPoint. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, thank you, uh, Murray, and thank you, CSAS, for hosting and convening this uh, really interesting and important day. Uh, while the PowerPoint's being opened, I should say I noted with some dismay that I was the odd man out and the only one bringing slides and that even uh, the representative from Microsoft didn't bring a PowerPoint. So I don't know what, <laughs> what that says. I'm going to apologize in advance to the folks on my left because I'm going to have to look a little bit at my slides over here. I'm going to echo some of the remarks that uh, Dr. Han and, Doc, and uh, uh, Sumita San uh, said about energy mix. I might have a few different uh, conclusions, but I'm going to talk a little bit about energy security through energy diversity, and I'm going to focus really only on the power sector. I'm not going to talk about uh, transportation oil, but this is power sector. And so the first thing I'm showing is that um, this is the mix of capacity across Asia, so this includes China, India, ASEAN, Japan, Korea, et cetera, Australia. Um, and you can see the brown there, the big wedge on the right, has increased a substantial percent. It looks like my percentages are not uh, totally visible, but you can see that the, the percentage currently in 20, at the end of 2013 is slightly more than 50% coal. The uh, sort of green box in the middle there at 5%, that's, that's uh, the renewables, uh, the 2% in red, that's nuclear. You can see that our projections for the following 10 years show a beginning of a reversal of the trend for the last 10 years. So again, a lot of this is because of China, right? So this great run up in coal in China influences the entire Asian energy picture. And over the next 10 years, some of that begins to reverse. There's more nuclear, there's more wind, there's more solar, there's, uh, and gas kind of holds its own. Next slide, please. Now, across the different economies in Asia, the growth varies, and there are different reasons for that, right? There are different priorities. For example, priorities on nuclear in Japan, which is still, I think, figuring out what will happen to all of the plants that are now offline, versus some of the ASEAN economies that are beginning to seriously consider nuclear as part of their energy future. Um, you can see huge increases in the rates of solar and wind, for example, in, across the ASEAN economies. Uh, over 700% growth in those uh, in capacity over the next decade, um, whereas uh, coal, you know, still growing, um, but not nearly as quickly as some of the other as some of the other options. Um, and again, you know, sort of a, a strong push for increasing role of gas across many Asian economies. Now, to get to this point, to get to a uh, energy system or a power system that has more diversity in it, less coal in it, there are a number of challenges that economies will face. And the first is, as was mentioned by Dr. Hanan, Sumita San, um, the fuel price, right? So you can see on the uh, left of these various bars, the coal price across the region, I've got some just representative economies here, is significantly lower than both the diesel price and the gas price. The second bar there is the, is the price in 2024. So the difference between $2 gas and $14 gas in Malaysia, or 4 and 16 in Japan, I mean, these are really enormous differences. And so getting away from coal um, is going to depend on some required 
you know, it was going to require concerted and long-term actions. Another challenge, again, as referred to by Dr. Hahn, is the really huge increases in electricity demand and all of the attendant infrastructure costs that come with that. You don't just have to build the power plant, you need to build the transmission, you need to build the LNG terminal. There's a lot that needs to be built. Um, despite that huge growth, um, by the end of the following 10 years, we still don't see the same energy access uh, across Asia that we, that we see in, uh, in Japan or certainly not in the United States. So for example, by 2024, despite the really kind of un unfathomable almost increases in electricity demand that we've seen in China and that we expect to see in China, they will still have you know, two thirds the electricity per capita than Japan today to say nothing of ASEAN or India. So huge gaps will remain even after the coming decade of growth. But there are even more challenges, right? So for example, what will Japan, how will Japan replace the nuclear fleet that, the portion of the nuclear fleet that won't return? Um, in Japan, there's some very, uh, very high tariffs for wind. So, you know, wind producers get uh, an incentive to produce, but there's very arduous permitting. It takes three or four years as opposed to one, which is what it takes here to get a, a wind plant up. In Korea, it's very, very difficult to cite any new plants, really strong nimbyism. Um, China has uh, lots of new policies to discourage or almost prohibit in some cases the siting of new coal plants in many of the coastal provinces. Um, water use, many of these power technologies require an enormous amount of water. There's uh, pressure from both agriculture and just general scarcity. We were talking a little bit about issues in, in uh, Lao PDR. Um, grid topology, so this is something that I think people don't quite appreciate. Um, it's very hard to power an island. First of all, if you don't have somewhere from which to uh, move power in, you have to have more plants available to provide reliable power. But then, of course, transmission connections across islands or gas connections across islands is enormously difficult. Um, and then in the non-island countries of China and India, you just have these vast expanses, so huge transmission lines. Um, financing, we talked a little bit about how hard it is to build a very heavy capex plant. Um, the OPEX, the long-term operations of the plant, get worse if you've got um, foreign exchange issues, right? So if you've got dollar-denominated fuels and your, and your uh, local currency is weaker against that dollar, then the cost of buying the fuel over time just gets harder and harder. Okay, so GE is a technology company, and so some of the solutions that I'm going to present are mainly uh, technology solutions. But so one way forward is more gas and more efficient use of that gas. So the chart I'm showing on the left is the increase, our projected increase in the natural gas supply in China over the next 10 years. And it's about a threefold increase by 2025. And how are they getting there? Some of it is pipeline from places like Turkmenistan. Some of that is increasing liquefied natural gas, LNG uh, purchases from you know, all parts of the world. Um, some of that is unconventional gas, their own shale gas resources and their own tight sands, another kind of unconventional gas resources. So um, more gas available through China, similar kind of story, not as dramatic, excuse me, for, uh, for ASEAN. But there's also a technology story, which is that, you know, in addition to the, to the supercritical coal or ultra supercritical coal, there are new uh, combined cycle gas plants. So for those who aren't familiar with the terminology, a combined cycle gas plant uses both a gas turbine and a steam turbine. It's, you know, about twice as efficient as a, as a coal plant. And the, uh, the very latest uh, and the newest, most efficient is from us. It's, an, it's called the HA combined cycle. And we're talking now 61% efficiency, which just a few years ago was really almost unthinkable. So this is a dramatic improvement in how uh, efficiently we can use gas. Um, next slide, please. Another way forward, this is something that I think is really uh, going to lead to dramatic changes in ASEAN. So Dr. Han talked about the lack of infrastructure for gas. One of the ways that um, countries there are beginning to get around this is something called a virtual pipeline. So what does this mean? Instead of the traditional route where you've got a actual pipeline brought in on a huge tanker and a humongous uh, 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 regasification facility from, for your LNG, basically you have uh, smaller LNG, you have compressed natural, natural gas or small LNG. So if you can have CNG, you can put it in a, in a box basically, you can just put it in a little, uh, in a truck and you can use roads and barges to 
get it to where you need it to get it without building a whole expensive pipeline. And of course, if you don't have, if you're not committed to one pipeline, you have much more flexibility in how you get from uh, origin to destination. So it provides a whole new degree of flexibility. Um, the first one uh, in Indonesia, we've got a MOU with uh, Indonesia's uh, state utility PLN to develop virtual pipelines, and we've just uh, commissioned recently a CNG-fueled island power plant, and it's about a 35% savings versus diesel. So really kind of incredible change in how um, gas is going to be delivered. Um, the, time, the scale, of course, is, is quicker. It's months instead of years to get these things done. Uh, it displaces diesel. There are lots and lots of advantages here. Um, in addition, some of the engines that can use these gas turbines, or, or sorry, that can use the gas, can also use biogas. So with all of the biomass resources in Asia, we're talking about um, on the remote islands in particular, you can use woody biomasses, um, gasify them, and put them in our reciprocating engines. So flexible power solutions, modular, small. Um, post the tragedy of uh, Fukushima, we can't think of nuclear without first questioning how is it going to be safe. Um, one of the new technologies that GE has available is the economic simplified boiling water reactor, ESVWR. It doesn't, it's not much less of a mouthful. But it's now the safest reactor design available. It was actually just uh, about a week ago, I think, passed another uh, review by the U.S. Uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. Um, it's, uh, it passively cools for seven days, which is uh, twice as good as our, our competitor. Uh, it's simpler in that there are far fewer components than a traditional power plant. You don't even need steam generators anymore, so there are fewer things that can go wrong. You need fewer people to operate it. There are fewer, th fewer things that can uh, fail, 11 fewer systems in, in total. Uh, you need 20% fewer staff to operate it. So there are all these advantages to nuclear that I think we need to, to consider rather than writing it off entirely. Um, lastly, uh, in terms of the solutions we're offering is um, wind plants that are designed specifically for land-constrained environments. So our 285, uh, 103, in other words, that's 2.85 uh, megawatts per turbine. That's a very, it's a big turbine. And the idea is that if you've got a land-constrained environment, you need power density, a lot of power from one turbine. And so this is a, a design that's, that's uh, made specifically for, the, for Japan, um, but obviously it, it could be uh, transferred with just minor modifications to other land-constrained environments. Um, I think that's it for, uh, for the wind slide. And that's it. Thanks very much for your time. I guess as a, a layman, not an energy expert, one of the uh, questions that emerges almost immediately when I listen to these different presentations is that Michael has suggested there's a lot of pretty nifty technology out there to, that's a lot cleaner than what we're using now. And Dr. Han says, yeah, we'd like that clean technology, but we can't afford it. So my question really for, for any of you, but particularly for John, emerging economies in Asia that want to buy cleaner, even if it's coal, cleaner burning technology but can't afford it. Is there, are, is there credit out there someplace? Yes, uh, in, in the case of Japan, uh, J Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, investment bank, uh, JBIC, uh, is now supplying some financial support to Uh, schemes to help uh, developing countries in Asia uh, to deploy uh, low, uh, low carbon technologies. Speaking from uh, from the U.S. perspective, um, this is a this is a tricky landscape in lots of lots of different ways. First of all, um, uh, the the things that uh, we spend a great deal of time and focus on at the U.S. Department of Energy uh, in some of the technical collaborations that we have with uh, international partners and with industry domestically in the United States um, is on technology development and 
coming down the cost curve. And you can see if you look at some of the, the different suites of technologies across the energy landscape, how dramatic the progress has been. So you see onshore wind in, uh, in solar PV, um, the same starting to happen in concentrated solar uh, power. So um, the, the opportunities of today and of tomorrow are not identical, point, point one. Uh, point two, there is a, um, a, a strategy issue um, uh, that is an important one Um, the uh, United States um, understands uh, that coal will be a part of the global energy mix. It certainly is a part of the energy mix of the United States, although uh, today's share of coal in our total fuel mix uh, is uh, significantly reduced from that which it was as little as 10 years ago. You've seen a, a drop from where coal traditionally has been about 50 percent of the U.S. fuel mix. And this in response to the um, real-time movement of natural gas prices in the U.S., where um, uh, a very surprising thing happened where you had coal and natural gas representing roughly equal shares for a short time, about 32 percent of our fuel mix. Um, so we expect that coal will be a part of the, the fuel mix going forward, both in the United States and elsewhere. true, as uh, Sumitha San and Dr. Han have, have both uh, underscored, um, that uh, all things being equal, it is preferable to have higher efficiency coal technologies in the marketplace. There's no question about that. The U.S. perspective, though, is that the use of public finance to support um, non-carbon capture uh, technologies uh, in the marketplace is not As, uh, as the IEA's energy technology perspectives um, uh, document that was just released uh, in, uh, in the summer um, stated, and I'll quote because it's a very, I think, uh, appropriate um, distillation of this issue, the unrelenting rise in coal use without the deployment of CCS, carbon capture and sequestration technology, is fundamentally incompatible with our climate change objectives. Uh, the broad use of uh, public finance um, through multilateral or bilateral uh, sources, we do ha have an exception to that rule, which is for the least developed uh, uh, economies. Uh, but um, otherwise, this is a, uh, a conscious choice to um, try to put uh, our emphasis in um, moving that technology frontier. we are doing in our own market, um, and from that seeing costs uh, change so that this technology is broadly affordable. Uh, opening it to the questions, oh, sorry. Dr. Hahn, please. I, I just would like to have idea, actually. I, I respect the Jonathan idea. we have to stick to the reality in terms of foreseeable future that in our prediction that in terms of coal power plant, it's, it's, it continues to rise. I think in that regard, if in terms of climate change and other, is I think we have to share the same concern and interest. But let's look, analyze this reality and scenario carefully. will link to less efficient coal power plant. So I think the scenario is which one actually you're going to take. If 
let's say, superpower country like you as concerned on environmental issue, I think we carefully analyze those scenarios. Because ASEAN is going to end up in power plan for, for, for civil future. In that regard, to reality, for, for that, we need to have support to make sure that until they have something breakthrough in terms of technology, like LNG and other, ASEAN cannot afford, East Asia cannot afford. As I stated already that this uh, excitement in US uh, uh, about sale gas, Asia do not enjoy at all. Because in terms of energy security, as those gas demand is continuing billion of people that not access to electricity call the most thing that they are going to build up more power plant. In that regard, I still stick to the public financing that to be more realistic and also provide a, a better environmental uh, issue because it's a global issue anyway. I do not, uh, just I want to say my concern only. Thank you. Please we'll open it up. Piece. I actually just want to follow up on the previous question, um, like with like um, multilateral um, financiers like the World Bank and um, the ADB being, um, being more reluctant to finance like coal power plants. I was wondering if other financiers might actually step in into public financing, like Chinese financier, uh, Japanese financier, or like the um, the newly like established uh, BRICS um, the development. Uh, our concern is uh, the Japanese concern is that uh, like that. I mean, if the, the, uh, there is no uh, public support from World Bank or uh, ADB or something like that, then the other organization like BRICS Bank or AIIB may have some opportunity to um, to, to finance. Uh, Uh, discipline, uh, like uh, focusing only on the high efficient uh, coal power plant, then it's it's okay. But uh, if they have no discipline, uh, just uh, financing uh, every uh, new project, then uh, it is quite a uh, miserable situation where the CO2 emission will be increased. Uh, deploy the carbon, carbon, uh, green, green coal technologies. Tom? My name's Tom Cutler. I'm an independent energy consultant, and I first want to compliment the panelists for their presentations on what I would say are the long term aspects of the changing calculus of Asia's energy security. My question is on the short-term aspects of energy security in the region, let's say contingency planning for an oil supply disruption. So the questions are, is the region prepared in terms of strategic oil stocks or uh, oil sharing plans for an oil supply disruption? Um, is the institutional architecture of the region, the various uh, international forums such as the IEA, ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, APEC, as well as the East Asia Summit, are they up to the task in terms of the region's institutional framework in dealing with short-term energy crises such as an oil supply disruption using tools such as strategic oil stocks or international oil sharing plans? And if not, what can be done? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It's a, that's a great question, um, uh, and it kind of brings out the, the reality that simultaneously we all together have to do two things. Uh, one is 
manage the situation in which one exists now, and the other is uh, put in place the tools and the both institutional and technological that can uh, help us to move forward. Um, I would say that from the U.S. perspective, uh, we think that this issue very promising uh, collaborations that have gone on, but I would not for a moment uh, say that it is sufficient. Um, uh, in some regards, the well, to highlight a couple of examples of, of collaboration that has already been underway, uh, you could look at the work that the International Energy Agency has done um, with a, a number of East Asian partners uh, looking at um, preparedness uh, responses, what uh, strategic reserves are in place, what one would do, how uh, 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 industry could meet its requirements uh, and continue to uh, provide for the population. Um, uh, Thailand, for example, has been a very active participant uh, with IEA, has done a couple of emergency response exercises. Um, uh, has hosted uh, a, a, a region-wide uh, engagement. China, of course, is another very important uh, East Asian partner in this regard, as now the, the, the world's uh, largest oil importer. Um, there, I would say, to, to be candid, we hope to um, find deeper collaboration going forward with China. Um, uh, the, China is building its own strategic reserves, which is an important step to happen. Uh, we think that uh, there is a great deal of, of uh, scope for technical and policy and other interactions so that China, which has this enormous stake in the functioning of today's global oil markets, um, can provide the kind of transparency that is the necessity for all uh, global participants, including China, to make informed decisions. And we welcome the steps that uh, the Chinese uh, National Energy Agency uh, has, uh, administration has uh, taken together with the Department of Energy to deepen collaboration in this area. We think it's a really, really important thing. So um, institutional framework, um, good start, much more needed. Thanks so much, Tom, uh, for a question. Uh, actually, you yourself is the one who really understand more on this issue. Uh, actually, ASEAN, in contact, I talk about ASEAN, that we, we, have, we try to come up with similar kind of IEA requirement of 90 days of strategic reserve, that I think in terms of oil stockpilings and, uh, of course, gas could be included in some of the country, but this originally particular just for oil. And ASEAN, as you know, that not many countries meet those 90 day requirement because most of the stock are hold at inventories at this company level. So it's less than 30 days, mainly. And then only some country like currently Thailand and others step up, commit to 90 days, 60 days to 90 days. Uh, I think except Japan and uh, is having an, almost 200 days, I guess. And China currently also has building stock, but we do not have much record clearly about China. And I think in that regard, in terms of ASEAN particularly, uh, we, we understand that building this kind of facility are very huge cost investment. And uh, one, one time I have provided comment during this uh, uh, meeting of APSA, we call ASEAN Petroleum Security Authorities, that uh, with support from the IEA, it's important that because when you build this strategic reserve, it has to be linked closely in terms of economy. It doesn't need for ASEAN country to have not holding stock for 90 days. Sometimes it's not necessary because there are many practices in the region. You can exchange, swap kind of thing. Uh, it's important to look closely in terms of structure or economy of each country because the, the, the reserve itself just to prevent if there's any disruption within seven days or two weeks, it could hit the economy of that particular country. So some countries are small in terms of structure or economy. It do not have to step up building those kind of reserves. But regional cooperation in terms of trust and other, it become more significant and important. So ASEAN will look at the requirement, but also will pursue in the way how very cost effectively we can uh, implement this strategic reserve in ASEAN uh, country. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, in the case of Japan, we see the importance of the co collaboration among Asian countries uh, uh, to respond to such kind of um, uh, crisis. Uh, so that's why uh, in recent uh, years uh, we have uh, talked with ASEAN colleagues uh, uh, under the framework of Japan ASEAN or ASEAN Plus Three uh, mechanism uh, to how we can on what how we can uh, tackle this issue in a cooperative manner. But uh, the uh, discussion is still uh, in a very early stage, uh, so uh, in such a sense it would take some more time until uh, the, uh, some kind of more concrete uh, solution might be. Uh, decided or agreed. Other questions? Please, gentlemen here. I'm uh, Mark Wall, former U.S. State Department, uh, more recently University of Wyoming. Uh, my question concerns nuclear power. We, we had some comments on that, but uh, would uh, the panelists care to comment further on the future of nuclear power in the energy mix, uh, particularly in Japan, but al uh, also elsewhere in Asia. Uh, as to Japan, uh, uh, at, at this moment, as you know, uh, there is no nuclear power plants in operation. And in the past, uh, three years ago, uh, the portion of the nuclear power plants in the total power supply was 32%. Uh, but at this moment, that is zero. Uh, now, uh, it's uh, some kind of uh, effort uh, for restart, some nuclear power plants is ongoing. And as to the initial two nuclear power plants, um, uh, we ha uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Authority approved the uh, safetyness of those two nuclear power plants. Uh, that's why we are now in the process of persuading the local people. Um, and I hope that in the early next year, by the early next year, uh, we will have uh, the restart of those two nuclear power plants. And uh, already uh, 20 nuclear power plants have, um, uh, have uh, uh, already uh, presented the, uh, uh, presented the uh, plan uh, for ask, to, asking, to ask for the approval uh, to the Nuclear Regulatory Authority. So one by one, uh, those um, applications will be uh, examined. And uh, during this one or two, uh, two or three years' time, some more nuclear power plants will be restarted. But at this moment, it is very difficult to expect to what, to what percentage uh, we can rely upon the uh, nuclear power plants. But the very clear direction is that uh, the Japanese government needs to decrease uh, the dependency on nuclear power plants uh, for, long, for a long, long term period. Just thanks to Mike for the question. Just uh, want to share with you that for ASEAN perspective, to, so that you can understand that uh, we do not deny any nuclear power. Actually, it's always the option of the energy mix, but that will uh, requires a lot of human capital and uh, also capital cost itself. It's very expensive. It just cannot. Currently, only Vietnam is uh, uh, under uh, construction of those uh, nuclear power power plant, but Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia also considering, but I think they are a public opponent to those kind of nucleus uh, in Asia. It's, it's uh, very strong. We, uh, since Fukushima uh, accident, I think we are uh, very kind of uh, concerned about nuclear power and he makes in the future in ASEAN itself. Uh, the institute area uh, where I'm working for, at, uh, now we are working on more on e uh, emergency response and preparedness in terms of data sharing and other is supposed uh, in terms of accident, how countries are cooperated in terms of sharing data and information uh, in a faster manner. So in that regard, we can uh, uh, build a working group in ASEAN members. So again, that uh, this uh, nuclear is one of the option, but perhaps it's not really now. And also upfront cost very high, four or five times higher than current coal power plant. Thank you. Michael. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, you know, and one of the issues with, with nuclear is also the, the infrastructure that needs to be added to the grid. So you can't just put in a nuclear plant anywhere. The transmission system itself needs to be robust and hardened. And so 
for ASEAN countries in particular, that's one of the challenges, is not just the upfront cost of the plant, but all of the uh, infrastructure that comes with it. Uh, elsewhere in Asia, I mean, the Chinese ambitions for nuclear are sort of startling. I think it's on the order of 50 gigawatts over the next 10 or 12 years that they're planning on adding. Uh, and in, in India, um, you know, we've been encouraged with the recent news of Prime Minister Modi's visit, uh, signaling some uh, willingness to relook at the nuclear liability law, which is a major obstacle to development of nuclear there. Um, I just jump in to um, take advantage of this, uh, this question and um, link back to the frame of this panel, which is about energy security uh, uh, by its title. Um, from our perspective in the U.S., we feel very, very strongly that energy security derives first and foremost from a high degree of diversification and good systems, including institutional systems, around uh, the, the energy economy. Um, we certainly will see um, uh, nuclear being continuing to be a part of the fuel mix in the United States. Obviously, other countries need to make their own choices. Um, but we do see a, a real value, uh, particularly in a world looking for low and no carbon uh, energy solutions, we see a real value uh, in the civil nuclear sector and see this as being an area that is full of uh, uh, potential for important collaborations also, again, to move the, the, uh, the frontier, the technology frontier, whether one is talking about small modular reactors or other uh, new promising technologies that may be just over the horizon. We're almost out of time, but uh, do you, is your question fairly short and can, because we have two or three minutes standing between us and lunch. Thank you. This uh, question is addressed to Dr. Can you Hanson. please identify yourself, please? Oh, I'm Nina, Nina reynolds -Ray. I work for the Children's National Medical Health System. This uh, question is addressed to Dr. Fumin. You mentioned population as one of the things that you would have to face eventually down the road, either double or tripling. Has your institute that you, that you work with, has it partnered with any ASEAN uh, Department of Health agencies, either at the regional, local, or uh, national level to address this with the hope that it would eventually reduce the number of consumers and the demand for energy consumption? Thank you very much. I think <laughs> it's very hard for me to address this. I think be, uh, besides China have a clear policies on those population, but ASEAN do not have any population uh, policy in terms of have to, uh, actually we, we do not have kind of restriction, but of course I, I'm, I'm economist background, perhaps I may not fully, uh, I, I'm aware of the issue, but. I think there's a lot of public health program in terms of providing us more safe and uh, kind of maternal mortalities and children and other, but it's not really control population growth uh, in itself. So uh, ASEAN, uh, actually there's a sector working on those, but I'm, I'm work for ASEAN and East Asia and uh, not really particular tight on those issues, but I'm aware that there are no uh, any policy that is uh, controlled in terms of population growth for ASEAN itself. Um, before I um, make, uh, before I, I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists, I, I need to make an announcement. So right after this panel ends, we're going to break for lunch. People are requested to go get their food very quickly. And